get with us. I'm sure he will. It. I'm sure he will at some point. Um, until then, I'll uh, I'll carry on and take his place. So I'm going to be reading off a bit of a script because uh, it's been a bit last minute. So um, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody to uh, to the um, Kane Shuman Aerial Forum. Um, we're online again, as you're probably all aware. Um, as to just remind everybody that because we're online, um, to keep your background noise to the minimum, and if you could possibly keep yourselves on mute until time as you as you need to speak, um, there is a facility, as you know, on Zoom that you can raise your hand and or uh, MIS it or missed well, you it, maybe you want to speak. Um, and please speak in turn and obviously talking over people. You know the rules, I'm sure. Um, just to remind people, as Sarah just said, that we are recording um, this session for um, uh, for YouTube. So if anybody doesn't you know, want to appear in all the glory on YouTube, then please sign yourselves off. Now, I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we we'll get a few Oscar nominations out of it at the end of the day. So here we go. Um, we've got quite a packed agenda. Um, we have got a couple of apologies. We got Tam Pam Tooten has apologised, and Councillor Andy Waite is also apologised. Have got any more, Sarah? No, as far as I know, um, we don't have any other apologies. But if anybody does, please could you type that into um, into the chat, and we'll make sure that's recorded. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure Sarah will help me through this. Is say um, today's agenda is basically in in two parts. Um, the first part is preparing for the future, um, and it's a presentation by Richard Doan, who's the head of uh, planning policy. And it's basically to give an update on the local plan and consultation, um, along with um, Fidelia Richardson, is that right, Zara? Um, from the council's public health team. It will also provide an update on the health and wellbeing strategy. Um, I think it's going to be a joint presentation, and there will be an opportunity to um, to read uh, to ask any questions after and hopefully get some answers as well. Let's say that be in two parts. The second part will be an update from on developing uh, livable neighbourhoods, and that's coming from Ashley Brighton and he's the project manager, and Joanne Sammons, who's the assistant transportation manager, and also Claire Graham. It's a three-way thing this time. Uh, behavioural change team uh, leader on Baines, and again following that presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions uh, and hopefully answers as well. Um, so I think with that, Cyril, I think it's handing over to Richard, I believe, is that right? Thanks. Yes, Thanks, sorry. Andy. Yeah, yeah Go sorry. On, sorry. I'm just, I'm just um, loading up your PowerPoint, Richard, so bear with me. So if you could sort of um, do your intro, it was a song and a dance while I just um, call it up, so bear with me. <laughs> And there's absolutely no way I'm going to do that, Sarah, especially as this is being recorded for YouTube. But anyway, um, right. So actually, it, it, as, as Adrian said, it's a, it's a sort of joint presentation uh, by myself and Fidelia Richardson uh, on both the health and well-being strategy and the local plan, because the two projects are, are very much uh, linked, uh, both in terms of objectives, but also in terms of wanting to engage uh, communities on those on those projects. So the presentation actually will be kicked off by Fidelia and then she'll take us through the health and wellbeing strategy and then uh, I'll present a few slides on, on the local plan as well. Um, are we ready to roll, Sarah? We are. Okay, I'll hand over to you then, um, Fidelia, if that's all right. Daily, I think you're on mute. Hello. Good, good evening. My name is Fidelia Richardson. I'm the health and well-being strategy manager for Baines. Um, I work with Nancy Towers, who's the health and well-being strategy officer. And together we're working to create or develop a new health and well-being strategy for Baines. And good news. Just today, we've just launched our survey, so we can actually go into more detail about what the survey looks like. Um, but we can start with the presentation. Next slide. 
So our presentations are joint, like Richard said, um, it's going to be a combination of the health and well-being strategy team presentation and the local plan team's presentation because the work that we're doing is pretty um, similar. What we're trying to, to change, the changes we're trying to make in communities is very similar. So the council is at an early stage of developing some long um, plans for North Bath and North East Somerset. In this presentation, we talk about the two, so the health and wellbeing strategy and the local plan. They are closely linked together, of course, by their focus on improving people's lives. And we share common outcomes for people in places such as homes, transport, jobs, tackling climate change. We will look also at working together with communities as we develop them. So a major part of that, like I mentioned previously, is that survey that has now launched. We want to hear from residents, but not just residents, but some people who also not necessarily living in Baines, but work with people in Baines as well. And we value your feedback on our plans, of course. Next slide. Almost every aspect of our lives are impacted by our health and how long we will live. This includes our jobs and homes, access to education and public transport. In Bath and Northeast Somerset, we know that lives are being cut short. People who live in certain areas are dying earlier than they should. Next slide. So we need the right building blocks in place so everyone in our communities can thrive. So these are just some wider determinants of health that we look closely at as they do interrelate with our health and well-being. Housing, for example, consider um, not having the, the best heating or the proper heating that can result in damp and mold. I just can result in people being really cold and, and it's just not feeling well. And that does impact your health, your mental health and well-being as well. Your family and friends, the food we eat, having enough to eat um, is, a, is another factor that can, um, can result in poor health, transport. So of course, be having access to, to the right transportation to be able to say, get to doctor visits and so on that impacts your health and well-being, the type of work that you do, education and skills, of course, are directly linked to your health and well-being, your surroundings. So what type of um, what kind of facilities are there in your communities? Are there parks? Are there places where you can walk, uh, run, exercise, cycle? And of course, money and resources that feed into all of these things. Next slide. So housing, let's, let's focus in on that. In our area, the highest cost of housing and relatively low wages makes it difficult for many to afford decent homes. 5,842 households are on waiting lists for social housing and increased from 12.5% from 2021. People are living in crowded conditions are housing that can't be heated or ventilated properly, which of course leads to damp and mold. Next slide. So why is your health and well-being important? It sets out the vision that we want to achieve the health and well-being strategy. Sorry, why is that important? It sets out the vision of what we want to achieve for health and well-being in Bath and Northeast Somerset. It identifies the key priorities for improving health and well-being. It will drive and influence the delivery of health and social care, provides an integrated framework that aligns all other local strategies. Like you see today, we can work along with the team that are working on the local plan because all our, all our efforts will be interrelated. It seeks to target priorities that will reduce health, and, health inequalities and support all to live healthy and well lives and it engages our local partners and communities to ensure local needs are being met. Next slide. Apologies, my, um, my thing that says I need to take a, um, a break is actually making noise on my computer. <laughs> I may need to okay, stop. Okay. Developing health and well-being strategies. So these are the steps that we're going to be taking to be developing it. Um, we, we have already communicated and been in, 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 in many stakeholder engagement sessions virtually. Um, we're about to have a very important um, engagement session with third sector organizations that will be held on October 11th. 
And now that we've launched a public consultation, we're going to be looking at what the next steps will be. So when we receive the results from that consultation, we will be looking at more focus groups. So once we see what the results of those consultation, the public consultations are, we will focus in and narrow into more of what we're seeing people saying are the key priority areas that we need to look into. So this just speaks to what our process is to develop the strategy. Currently, we are at the public consultation stage. Then we'll move into some focus groups. From that, we will go back to the health and well-being board, try to set those priorities and confirm those with the board, make sure that they agree. And then from there, we will draft the health and well-being strategy. We'll have a first draft, then we'll have a second draft, and hopefully by January, we'll have our final draft that is ready to go. Next slide. So of course, to get it right, we need to hear from you, and that is why we are here. We need to understand from residents of Baines what their key priorities are to them, based on them in their households, for their families, and also what they see in their communities. So of course, what you experience in your household might not be a reflection of what you see your neighbors you know, experiencing. So we want to understand what you have experienced in your household, for your family, and also what you've seen in your community. And that's very important. When it comes to access to social care or access to health care, we're gonna dig, dig a bit deeper. We're gonna ask, okay, what specific services you're having challenges with? Um, and if you have challenges, we want to know specifically, you know, what 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 are the so what are the specific challenges? Whether it's long wait lists, whether it's not being able to get to your um your your doctor visits because of lack of transportation, and just being able to understand these things will help us to be able to create a health and well-being strategy that seeks to to target or to implement programs that will help to to remediate these situations. And if anyone has any questions, I will be happy to answer, but I, I will put the, the link to the survey in the chat, the public consultation, which launched today. And we would really like to hear from you. And we'd also like for you to share it within your networks as well. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer after Richard's uh, presentation. Thanks, Lynn, for the, uh, I think, probably next slide, then, Sarah. Oh, uh, I think that's a link to the, to the survey. So, yeah, so next slide, please. <laughs> so, yeah, go on to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. So, um, before I talk about the, the sort of new local plan, just uh, a reminder to everybody that uh, the council has also been preparing a, a partial update. Uh, as the name suggests, it updates parts of the current local plan. Uh, that plan is, in effect, if you like, almost a bridging plan to get us to, to the new local plan. But that uh, partial update is very well advanced in its process. Uh, but there is consultation uh, taking place now uh, through to the 2nd of November on what are called the main modifications. Those are the changes that have come out of the uh, examination hearings with the inspector. Uh, if anybody wants to comment on the, on the modifications, obviously I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, you send those to the council uh, and then we then simply send those to the inspector. So at this stage it's for the inspector to consider the comments on the partial update. Uh, he will then issue his report uh, to us, hopefully before the end of the year. And then we should be able to, with a fair wind, uh, adopt the partial update um, early next year. So that's the partial update. Just thought I ought to flag that because you may have seen details around, around the consultation. What we're doing alongside sort of finalising the partial update is starting work on the new local plan. Um, so we're publicly launching it in October through publishing a launch document, and that will be published uh, on the 4th of October, again, for consultation. So again, people can comment on the launch document. But the main purpose of the launch document really is, is as its name suggests, to actually launch the preparation of the new local plan. So it's a completely new plan long-term plan for sort of the next 15 to 20 years, really setting out what the council and what the communities want to achieve in terms of uh, place shaping and in terms of meeting the needs for new development within, within the district and within the places uh, across the district. Um, some of you may have heard that uh, or heard of 
sorry, the, the West of England Combined Authority uh, Spatial Development Strategy, or SDS for short, that uh, was due to be a, a long-term plan which would have established uh, how much housing and how many jobs we need to plan for for the next 20 years and would have established a, a broad spatial strategy, if you like, a framework for our local plan. But work on the, on the spatial development strategy has been halted. So the WECA mayor has decided to halt uh, work on the spatial development strategy. So basically the four authorities are going to work together on our local plans and it's the local plans which will set therefore the planning framework for the area so there is no SDS that means also that we will be through our local plan we will be establishing the amount of new development that we uh, need to plan for as well so as I've said it's a it's a, it's a new long-term plan and therefore it's an opportunity for us to be ambitious as a council uh, and, and ambitious as communities uh, and very much uh, it will align with other initiatives. As Fidelia has already said, uh, and we've already referenced it, it will align with the objectives of the health and wellbeing strategy, but also the economic strategy, green infrastructure strategy, and a range of other plans that the council is preparing. Um, next slide, please. So the launch document really sets out, if you like, the, the main priorities for the local plan as the council sees them at this point in time as well as the scope of the local plan and how we prepare to, how we propose, sorry, to, to prepare it. Um, so in terms of the priorities, um, obviously the overall purpose of both the council and indeed the local plan and the health and wellbeing strategy is to improve people's lives. Uh, and within that context, uh, the council is suggesting at this stage four main priorities of the plan. You can see them there on, on the slide. So responding to, uh, the, child, the climate emergency, uh, maximising delivery of affordable housing to really ensure that everybody that needs uh, access to housing uh, can get a, a decent home, which then obviously links to, to obviously their health and wellbeing. Um, nature recovery and, and very much, you know, making sure that we not only protect nature, but actually we try and enhance nature and, and its recovery uh, linked, to, linked to new development as well as creating opportunity for sustainable economic development. Really, that's the right types of jobs in the right places to meet the needs of uh, communities uh, across the district. Next slide, please. And then sitting beneath, beneath those sort of four primary uh, ambitions or, or priorities are a number of other crucial issues that, that the council considers it needs to address through the local plan. Uh, again, I won't go through those in detail, just to emphasise, it's not just about delivering housing, it's about delivering high quality development, high quality places that will help support uh, and, and, you know, enhance uh, and maintain healthy, successful uh, communities, as well as addressing inequalities. You know, there's a lot of that, there is a lot of inequality across uh, veins, you know, from, from obviously the very affluent to, to, the, uh, to, to the less uh, well off. Um, as well as just making sure that new community, sorry, new development is aligned with uh, key infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of working on the local plan, um, obviously the council doesn't want to just go away and prepare the plan. It, it, it very much wants to engage with uh, and involve local communities in that process right from the outset. It is quite a long preparation program of the local plan. It, you know, the, the new local plan probably won't be adopted until uh, early in 2025. But what I've put up there is, is just uh, a slide outlining some of the key early stages of engagement. So particularly from uh, this autumn through to early in the new year, we want to engage with uh, town and parish councils and uh, other community groups in understanding what the key issues are that are facing your communities. Uh, and, and the challenges, but also the opportunities and priorities moving forward. And then at, from that sort of discussion around issues and priorities, that will then feed through into another set of discussions where we start to identify uh, and generate options for addressing those issues. And again, we want to very much do that with, with communities. And all of that then feeds in into uh, consultation on, on the options document, which would be this sort of time next year. And at that stage, it would be a much broader 
public consultation with all with all residents, whereas the earlier work was suggesting that that would be more targeted with with specific groups. And I think the sort of request of, of yourselves really um, is to start thinking about how you'd like to be uh, represented at those workshops, how you would want to organise yourselves to engage in the work. So, for example, would that be a parish council working group? Or perhaps you've got neighbourhood planning groups already set up and you might want to make use of those. Really, it's, it's, it's up to you. But what, what we'll be doing is we'll be writing to you uh, soon, uh, formally, to all the parish councils and town councils, uh, asking for, for your response as to how you want to be uh, engaged in the work. Uh, and we really would like your response, if possible, by the end of October. Uh, and that's really because, as you can see on that slide, we're, we're looking to start uh, working with you and having those workshops um, from November onwards. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of, you know, the planning framework, not just for the town, but for the wide area, I suppose it's fair to say we're not starting from, from a blank canvas. There is an existing planning framework in place through our adopted core strategy, the placemaking plan, and uh, the partial update. That's just, for those of you who don't recognise it, that's a, that's a map from uh, the placemaking plan, which sets out the strategy for Canesham in terms of protecting uh, green spaces, uh, enhancing and trying to enhance the town centre, but also identifying sites for development, and particularly housing development. Uh, as you'll see, the purple areas there are, are the areas that many of you remember were removed from the green belt for, for development. Um, next slide, please. So just really to, to, to finish with, um, as I've said, we want to talk to you, particularly you know, from November on, onwards, around what the key issues are facing uh, the, the wider Canesham area. I mean, I, I've put up a few there just as a, a, as a starting point, but that may well not chime uh, at all with, with you, and you may have a series of different issues you would want to discuss, but things around job opportunities, things around the affordability and availability of, of housing are likely to be key. Um, given Cainton's location uh, on a very strong, or one of the stronger public transport corridors in the area, you know, what role would the Cainton area play in meeting the overall housing needs of the district? That, that you know, that will have to be um, discussed, but it's not all about development. It's also about infrastructure, so transport improvements, but it's also about opportunities to improve um, biodiversity uh, and, and, and the landscape, uh, as well as obviously that, you know, the health outcomes that, we want, that we're seeking uh, to achieve. And I put there, you know, as a key model, I've, I've sort of mentioned it already, Greenbelt. We will have to, you know, discuss, I think the, the importance of the Greenbelt, but also its, its future role, uh, you know, over the next, over the next 20 years. But it's not just all about Cainsham, I should mention that. It, it's very much about the town, but it's also about the villages, um, not just Saltford, but also the other, the other villages that are within the forum area. Um, so that's, that's the end of the, the presentation. Um, happy to take any questions, obviously for daily related to the health and wellbeing strategy, myself and the local plan. Um, happy to take those questions now. Thank you, Richard. Um, we have got one question that was flagged up, and there probably may be more as well. Um, and it's from the Borends, if I pronounce that right, and um, is asking why was the um, SDS halted? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it was the decision. <laughs> it was a decision of the of the Wecker uh, mayor to to halt the work, uh, and the reasons that he's given is that. He considered uh, that it was proving too difficult to get the local authorities to all agree on what the overall uh, amount of housing that should be planned for, uh, what that overall figure should be, and its distribution between the three authorities of, of Baines, Bristol and South Gloucestershire. Uh, and for that reason, he, he felt agreement was unlikely to be reached, and therefore he took the decision to halt the work on the SDS. So in the context of that decision, you know, the, the, the unitary authorities, you know, realise it's important to continue to plan for our future. Uh, and therefore we are continuing work on our, our local plans. And we will, you know, we will work together on those local plans to address, 
you know, some of the issues, and there are many issues that clearly cross cross the, the administrative boundaries, um, especially you know in this in this part of in this part of the world. Um, clearly, you know, Cainsham is quite close to Bristol. Mm -hmm. It's also quite close to South Gloucestershire. So we will have to discuss uh, the issues and work with our neighbouring authorities on our on our local plan. Thank you, Richard. Is anybody any any more questions from anybody, please? I can't see all the screen here, Sarah. So if yes. you see Agent, anybody, I miss. Agents, uh, Alan's got his hand up. Who who is actually at the moment as Alison Wells, but um, Alan is is joining he is. now, so he's here. <laughs> Hello, Alan. Um, Hello, Alan. You, you, you look a rather strange, Alison Wells. I must say. I know. I know. <laughs> Um, I got to be very PC. Um, <laughs> Richard, it, it concerns me when you start talking about Cainsham. I don't know whether you've been to Cainsham recently and just seen the, the traffic that we have going through the town. Um, the airport is going to be enlarged, so there's going to be more traffic through Charlton Road. Um, frequently we have roadworks, which that's fine, uh, that's transient, but Nonetheless, when I came to Cainsham in 1957, uh, the only thing since 1957 that's happened as far as the infrastructure in this town is concerned is that they built the bypass. But everything else in the town is absolutely the same. Clearly, there are far too many more houses and they've all got their own little roads, but they have to come out onto the existing infrastructure. And that existing infrastructure is over half a century old. So to start talking about the potential for the town taking more housing is quite frightening in my mind. Yeah, I, th I think that's, you know, that's, that's a very good point, Alan. Um, you know, transport and congestion within the town and the wide area, area is absolutely a key issue. And I suppose I should have said in, in preparing the local plan, we'll be working very, very closely with our transport uh, planning colleagues. Uh, and they will be looking at, um, you know, a, a, a transport strategy for the town. Um, I would say, I, I suppose, you know, in the context of the climate emergency, it may well be that, that many of the, the transport measures we're talking about here are will be geared towards you know facilitating increased movement by more sustainable modes of travel in particular you know walking and cycling that then links back you know very well to the to the health and well-being um, objectives but also public transport you know that there, there are and i'm sure you're aware of this uh weka was and continues to work on uh projects related to public transport improvements in the bristol to bath corridor um, so absolutely, Alan, we have to look at, at those congestion issues before we start talking about adding uh, further growth and further development uh, to the town. Can I also add to that, Richard, is, is on the same theme, actually, is, is Alan. I mean, what worries me about the um, Widwaka, actually, is and, and their role um, Kingsham is strategically placed very close to Bristol, very so close to South Gloucestershire as well. So I don't think we could look at road networks within Kingsham in isolation from what's going on in Bristol. I think the point Alan made about Charlton Road is very much a link now from Hicksgate to South Bristol, and that's increased out of all proportion over the last few years. So for me, the, the, those breakdowns, if you like, within the local authorities in Wacker is a bit worrying that you're not going to get that linked up, that strategic approach to transport and housing and, and all those other issues. No, again, Adrian, very much uh, agree, um, which is why we're putting in place at the moment, you know, much stronger arrangements to be working with our sort of unitary authority neighbours. But we're also, um, you know, wanting WECA obviously to be involved in those conversations and that work as well, because you, as you say, Whilst they've taken a step back from um, the spatial development strategy, they are still very much working on um, to uh, helping us derive, you know, the most appropriate strategy across the sub-region and, 
you know, the necessary projects as part of that. So we will continue um, to work closely with WECA, particularly on the transport side of things. Thank you, Richard. Sarah, is there, a, I can't see any more questions. Can you see any your end there? There are some questions and there's some comments. So I don't know whether Richard wanted to take them now in the chat or whether we can feed them back and then Richard could come back to us with some responses. Do you want to take them now, Richard, or do you want to come back? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take some now, but I suppose in the interest of, of not prolonging the meeting, um, you know, perhaps it would be easier if, if, if they were just, yeah, captured in an email and I'm happy to, to provide some responses. Okay. I think it's fair if anybody's got a bust in urge to have an answer now, Sarah, if there's any, any questions there that anybody really wants answered now, out of fairness. Yeah, there's, um, so shall we take one then, which um, yeah, go ahead. John, John's just submitted, John Fist um, uh, from Corston has just submitted a, um, a question. John, I don't know whether you want to ask it yourself or would you like me to read it out? You muted again, John. All oh, right, I'm, right, I'm back. <laughs> Um, basically, yeah, I listened to the news this morning, there was a forecast, a national forecast in the re reduction of general practitioners over, I forget the time, I think it was 10 or 15 years, due to people retiring because of stress and overwork. And I think that looking at the development here and bringing these two plans together, um, we've had an increase, I think, in, in the population uh, of our unitary authority over the past five years with the new developments. And of course, we're looking at doing more development in this plan. Um, and I thought that it would be useful if there was a local strategy to look at the local demands as these plans go forward to make sure that the GPs that we've got can meet the demand as the, as the population increases. Um, and it uh, just to be part of, of this work, really, if that makes sense. It, it, it does make perfect sense, John. Um, what I would say to that is, yes, we, we uh, you know, from a local plan perspective, we are working closely with um, the NHS and, and CCG in terms of, you know, assessing what the current um, picture is in terms of uh, GPs uh, and, uh, and, and availability and uh, providing them with information on uh, population growth arising from um, the local plan as we progress the local plan. And then, as you say, making sure that there is a strategy in place to, to meet that demand. Obviously, that is contingent upon, uh, amongst other things, as I understand it, funding from uh, NHS England, which we would have to we would have to bid for, but that's why it's really important to join up um, early in the process uh, and and make, uh, if you like, you know the the health service aware of our um, our plans early on. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's an important facet of the uh, overall plan. Completely. Agree. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Richard. Um, if that's all, could we move on to the second part? I think, Sarah. Um, and as I said earlier on, it's about developing livable, livable neighbourhoods and what it means to to the forum, certainly to to our forum. Um, and there's an update from from Ashley uh, and Joanna. Um, so I guess it's over to you guys. Uh, thanks so much, Adrian. Um, uh, I've got. Uh, uh, I've got Claire with us tonight. Joe's um, Joe's another event, so um, so there's just the two of us. Um, the uh, the other thing I'll say is that I'm actually a in a kitchen at one of our engagement events in Bath tonight. <laughs> so if there is a bit of background noise, I must apologise for that. Um, and this isn't my usual backdrop. Uh, listen, is it possible to share the slides? That's right. I can do it mine if needs be. I'll do a bit of filling while Alison's finding finding the right presentation. 
Um, thanks, Alison. That's great. Um, we've got a, a sort of sh a sh short series of slides um, to run through. Uh, there are there is some imagery in here, which is um, which is fairly urban. I'll be honest. Um, and what I'd just like to say is that that's because of where these sort of livable neighbourhoods have been um, put in to date, um, often in, in, in very sort of urban settings. Um, we are, however, um, doing some livable neighbourhoods. Um, one, one that we have that is in, I think, the former area, which is sort of uh, Queen Charlton and Whitchurch Village, um, uh, in, in more rural communities. And so um, please don't take those sort of images as is kind of all that it's about. Um, we are doing some work in, in rural communities as well. Um, and I think there are plenty of opportunities to do things, not only in, in settings like Canesham, but also in the villages and, and roundabout as well. Um, so as I say, um, uh, I'm the project manager for uh, Livable Neighbourhoods. Uh, Joe's uh, not with us tonight, but Claire, our behaviour change lead, is also, is also on the call uh, or on the Zoom. Um, next slide, please, uh, Alison. Thanks ever so much. Um, we're going to have a bit of a canter through what livable neighbourhoods are, um, why we need them, which ones we're doing first, so that first phase, um, where we've got to with that process, what we're doing now and what the next steps are, if that's OK. And then hopefully some Q&A at the end. If people want to ask questions as we go, I don't really mind. Um, so um, dive in if, if, if needed, if you've got a burning question. Uh, thanks, Alison. Next slide. OK, so in terms of what are livable neighbourhoods, um, essentially, um, what we're looking to do is create a bit of rebal rebalancing um, uh, so that roads are, aren't just seen as being for motorists, but also are for the sort of amenity of all users. Um, so we're often looking at, at creating more space for active travel. But I think also a really important facet of what we're doing, certainly in Baines, is taking a much more holistic view of, uh, of, liv of livable neighbourhoods. Often they've been very much traffic focused. Um, and looking at improving health and well-being and creating those healthier, more pleasant spaces for people to, uh, to sit, meet um, and feel that they're comfortable walking or, 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 or cycling around, as I say. Well, thanks, Alison. Next slide. Um, so what would we do in terms of putting uh, features in to enable that, to enable that, that sort of uh, look and feel that we're after? Uh, we're talking about wider pavements, drop curves, dedicated lanes for, for safer uh, uh, cycling. Um, potentially modal filters vehicle restrictions where we want to do that bit of rebalancing on the road network um, which can be achieved in, in a number of ways potentially com uh, combining that space that's created with better social spaces for people um, a good a good thing we often talk about as an example is is essentially creating a sort of chain of benches perhaps that enables people who are uh, who are less mobile to still make a, a journey on foot um, so lots of things like that, as I say, you know, a quite holistic approach to it. And it can include also residence parking schemes. Thanks, Alison. Um, this is very much uh, community driven. It's definitely a community led programme. Um, uh, I'm here tonight. We are um, we are reviewing the output uh, with residents of an exhibition. Sorry, uh, in an exhibition of uh, the output of a workshop. Uh, that they did, that they did uh, about a month or so ago, just to make sure that we've heard their views correctly, and we're taking forward then, uh, you know, the right the right ideas into into the design process. So it is very much community led. Um, we're also very focused on delivering uh, against the agenda uh, that the council has set around the climate and the ecological emergencies, and also a part of that is giving people a greater say. And I'll come to that in a in a little while as we sort of set out the process that we're going through. Um, they're not new, livable neighbourhoods. They have been, as I said earlier, you know, very traffic focused in the past, and we are taking a more holistic approach, but they have been successfully implemented. And I must be honest, in some places, not so successfully implemented um, uh, throughout the world. Um, and we are, we are sort of following, following in the footsteps of some, of some very successful schemes and learning the lessons that they have from, from their implementations as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, in terms of why we need these LNs, uh, a bit of what I touched on earlier, it's about creating space uh, for people to potentially use active travel, so walking and cycling. Um, often those people are discouraged, they don't feel safe doing so. Uh, and so uh, by creating space that people do feel safe, we've got that, uh, 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 you know, that, that area in, in the public realm where people can feel they can walk and cycle. Um, we're trying to uh, tackle climate and ecological emergencies. Uh, even in rural areas, like say Temple Cloud uh, is one. 
um, reducing those vehicle emissions, then improving air quality, and then uh, you know uh, tapping into that health agenda, so that health and well-being agenda as well. Uh, another important point is the one at the bottom. Um, I can think of uh, when we did clean air zone. You know, a lot of the a lot of the communities that are very impacted by uh, poor air quality, for example, are often those um, that are on these main routes um, and where we can potentially do things. So um, I think there's also a sort of rebalancing there as well that uh, that, that can be done. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, this isn't an anti-car program. Let's just be really clear about that. Uh, as I keep saying, it's more about rebalancing uh, so that a car doesn't dominate. Um, but we do have to tackle this to some extent, uh, not only in terms of what we do with infrastructure, but also with potentially the way we think, um, which is why Claire's involved in this project as well. Uh, and I'll come to it a bit more on the next slide. You know, if you look at the sort of the graphic on the on the right hand side, and we look at how efficient it is to use the available road space, bear in mind the road space isn't growing, but our demands on it are. Um, uh, you know, we need to be just mindful that if we move to electric cars or we even move to autonomous cars, you know, we've still got cars on this network uh, and the demand for that road space grows and grows and grows. And unsurprisingly, um, you know, we can't fit everything that we'd like to do and we need to then therefore think differently. Uh, so that's a little bit also of what this programme is about. Thanks, Alison, next slide. So uh, just building on that behaviour change piece, um, it doesn't need to all be about us doing something in terms of infrastructure. As individuals, we can make a choice. We can choose to do things differently. We can travel less. We can consume less. We can care more about others. And what I mean by that is, uh, is particularly, you know, a good example is when we are driving, perhaps we can think more about our driver behaviours, uh, potentially where we choose to go. So to keep to the main routes rather than darting off through people's, uh, through people's local neighbourhoods. You know, um, if we are going to use those streets, driving sensibly in a way that doesn't put people off who do want to walk and cycle. So that's just a small example of what we might be able to do. Um, we do have an ability to adapt. We can do this if we want to. Um, and I think what's really important, and Claire, we talk about this a lot, don't we? That, you know, uh, it's not giving up a car necessarily. It's not doing something enormous. It's making just those small differences. Uh, if, people, if that's all that people feel that they're able to do, will still, in aggregate, make a really, really big difference. If I take traffic, traffic levels here in Bath, uh, and I think about peak traffic, if we chop 20% of traffic out because people do something differently one day a week um, and we build that up and in aggregate we've chopped 20% out a day, that removes the peak, that removes the traffic peak. Um, so it's not, it's not sort of all or nothing. It's, it's adding these small things up to make a big difference. I think that's a really important point. And we can all do things, probably all do things today, to be honest with you. Um, um, anyway, next slide, please, uh, Alison, thanks. Okay, in terms of where we're doing these, uh, they are fairly bath focused, I will be honest, uh, at this moment in time. Um, we do, however, got, we do however, have a, a, an application that we're, we're, we're proceeding with in Temple Cloud. Um, and as I said earlier, we're doing a piece of work in Queen Charlton and Whitchurch Village, um, which we can we maybe touch on just as we move through the next few slides. Um, thanks, Alison. In terms of what we've achieved so far, we've agreed the strategy back in autumn 2020. Summer 2021, 48 communities came forward with requests for livable neighbourhoods and through a kind of prioritisation exercise, 15 areas were selected, which were the ones I just showed on the previous slide. Um, and then we move into the bit that, uh, that kind of I'm, I'm, I suppose, engaged in. Winter 2021, we had a broad sort of public engagement on, on those 15 areas to identify what people felt were broad themes around what was good in their area, what issues they experienced and what they would like to see improved. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, that's now moved into the process that we're currently drawing to a close. In fact, this is the last exhibition we're doing tonight. Um, and then we move into the prioritisation exercise and into the preliminary design. So over the summer, residents attended the, uh, a series of workshops uh, where they shared ideas uh, and identified potential, potential solutions on maps. So the image on the, on the left is, uh, is kind of what we ended up with at the back end of those workshops. Um, and what we're currently doing and where I'm sat tonight is an in-person exhibition to showcase what people said to a wider audience and to allow people to decide what they liked and what measures they would like to see taken forward. So very, very engaged with the communities. Um, we've also uh, not just done these sort of what I might call mainstream work, uh, workshops and exhibitions. We've also taken what we've been doing on the road 
and visiting local groups who might find it hard to have their say. Um, so often those lesser heard voices, the schools, youth groups, lunch groups, those sorts of things. Um, I think we can do better, if I'm honest. We've made a start on it and the team are already working and thinking about how we can make that better for the next round of engagement that we do. Thanks ever so much, Alison. Next slide. So in terms of what's next, uh, as I touched on earlier, we're currently in this process of prioritising. So we're going to take what people have said that they would like to see as priority measures in their areas from the long list, you might call it, that people came up with in the workshops. Um, as officers, then we're going to have to look at those uh, priorities that people have come forward with as communities and say, can we deliver them? You know, are they cost effective? Can we do them in a reasonable amount of time? And, and those sorts of things. Um, make a recommendation of a shortlist, essentially, of intervent interventions that we then take forward to preliminary design. We'll engage again at that stage. Um, preliminary design is a really good stage to engage. We're expecting a very, very wide engagement at that point because we've got designs and drawings that people can get their heads around and can really understand and really engage with. So um, we're already planning that, even though it's uh, potentially two or three months away. And um, then finally, we'll wrap up with formal public consultation uh, where it's needed um are, are on specific measures and we can then move forward into into implementation we are bringing some trials forward uh so there is a potential pilot on queen charlton lane for example that we're looking to bring forward um as well as a whole host of measures in in the various areas as well um and i think just that final point there is again around this sort of giving people a bigger say i think you can see with the process that we've created you know, it's about building that consensus amongst communities. It's about hearing what people have got to say, getting that voice heard, um, and really driving driving that through this process. So it's very, very, much, very much community led, um, uh, and, and I think Claire, as a team, we're really we're really enjoying that. Okay, I think that's the end of the presentation. Next slide, Alison. I think it's Q and A, isn't it? Um, has anyone got any questions? There is a few questions that have come up, actually. I don't know whether you want to take them now. Um, okay. just I'm minute. happy to take them. Yeah, uh, let, let, I think do you want to take them now, actually? I, I can do, yeah. No problem at all. Yeah. yeah. There's one from um, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Hansel. That's, that's not you. It's not Chris, is it? I don't think. Chris, do you want to, do you want to still say your question? Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Just to say that um, and my question was, uh, we've had pictures of, of on. Um, rail never gets mentioned. Um, it doesn't take long to get from Temple Meads to, uh, to Bath. Um, pe more people could go on, on the rail rather than blocking up the roads, particularly if we had some interim sta stations at places like Salford. Um, now, I've had a, a useful comment from Claire to say, that uh, they're not, um, trains aren't on this because uh, Liverpool neighbourhoods, because obviously that's more, uh, you know, road based. But I was also referring to the previous um, speaker because that wasn't just talking about roads for Liverpool neighbourhoods. That was that was much um, wider brief. And yet, we, you know, you look at um, London with, I know they get a lot more money, but they've got, um, overground that's been added uh, has made a huge difference to the movements around. And if we could just use the rail lines we've got, um, yeah. I think we'd take a lot off the roads. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's right. I think. I think what what Claire's saying is quite right. This is this is a fairly localised program. So what we're often looking at is people's shorter trips. Um, Probably often, Claire, it's true, isn't it? Not necessarily even bus trips. We're, we're looking at those really short trips that people do um, and, 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 you know, quite often doing cars um, where they are genuinely walkable or cyclable. Um, thank you. Uh, should we take the next question? Would that help? Yeah, there's a question from uh, Bernard. Is that how you pronounce it? It's about Canesham High Street. Do you want to just okay. say that? It's uh, well, basically, I was asking whether you consider Kingston High Street to be a kind of livable neighbourhood type of activity. Can you hear okay, Ashley? You've got background noise. Um, from a health and well-being point of view, which we discussed earlier, this exercise has led to a lot of 
local injuries, so it hasn't been very good for the health and well-being. But I'm more concerned about where you have mixed cycle paths with pedestrian pavements, because even cycles on their own uh, are moving a lot more quickly than the pedestrians. They make less noise. And these days, more and more people have Ill illegal as well as legal electric scooters, which go even faster and have more momentum. So the Liverpool neighbourhoods, I think, although we're trying to get people moving locally, and I accept all that, um, squaring the circle of allowing that to happen while the different modes of transport are safe uh, is quite important from where I sit. I, th I think that's really right. And this is why um, uh, we're very focused on that behaviour change piece as well, because it is about, as I said in the presentation, you know, we do have to, uh, you know, become better citizens in a way, I suppose, you know, and be more mindful about our impact on others when we are moving around. Um, you know, unfortunately, there just isn't the space. And if we if there isn't the space to segregate everything, you know, we do need to be more mindful of others when we are moving around, don't we? Thank you. Maybe the design got a question. is such that it keeps the speeds under control. Yes. So a straight line is going to be a lot faster than, as we know, a lot of speed uh, control systems. A few bends and curves slows everything down. Yes, true. Yes, true. Thank you. We got a question from Alan as well. Alan, do you want to ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Um, Ashley, <coughs> excuse me. Yes. I can understand the value to Queen Charlton yes. uh, because it's it's set aside. Mm -hmm. um, with the consultations that you've done in Bath, yes, where communities have come forward, what wider consultation have you done? to all of those roads where they will take the collateral damage of rat running. Because, you know, here I am a, a councillor in Kenchum, but I've had certainly two emails from people living in Bath um, in the sort of Coombe Park area, mm -hmm. most indignant about the fact that they have had no consultation at all and they are likely yeah. to carry some of um, the diverted traffic. Yeah. How yeah. are you dealing with that? Yeah, so I think there's, there's kind of two parts to that. Um, one is that we are intending to do a wider engagement. Uh, I think, as I said earlier in the presentation, when we have those uh, preliminary designs, which we know, Alan, that people are much more comfortable engaging with, um, so we will go out and ask people on a much, much wider basis. And, and because that's going to be such a big engagement, we're already gearing up for it. There'll be a letter drop to a wider, much, much wider audience um, and really start to tease out people's concerns, like, for example, displacement. Um, I think it's also important to say that we're only in the concept design stage. People are only sort of shortlisting their ideas. And at the moment, we don't know if there is going to be displacement because a lot of communities we know from the work that we've already done, aren't necessarily pr 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 wanting to prioritise or promote um, restrictions on, on through traffic. They're wanting perhaps, uh, I think as, as we were just talking about actually, they're wanting traffic speeds to be slowed, not necessarily stopped, for example. Um, so I think what we need to do is see what, what comes out in the shortlist, develop those designs up, and then do that wider engagement piece once we're a bit clearer what communities would like to see in their particular local areas, if that, if that makes sense. The other thing I think is important is that we will then look, um, there'll be some instances where we have to look in, in areas where there are potentially several restrictions or several schemes to, to potentially slow traffic down, what that wider impact is. Um, others might be much more simple. Um, and in some areas, it may be appropriate to trial those through this experimental traffic regulation order kind of process and see how they go and what impact they do have. Um, I do know, and I think, Claire, we've, we experienced this with clean air zone work, didn't we? There often does become a lot of concern about potential rat running that doesn't actually materialise in practice. Some does, uh, I'll be honest, but often it doesn't. Um, and that we found that with clean air zone, uh, uh, with the clean air zone work that we did as well. So I think it is important to try and bring everyone along, not only those communities that are potentially benefiting, but also those communities that potentially feel that they're going to be disaffected by, by some of these measures. Um, and we intend to do that. So that's definitely part of the programme. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. 
Alan, can I ask you to take over your role as chair now? I've got another reason <laughs> in the background, actually. So I'm going to pass the, the, uh, the, the chair over to you, mate. All right. Thank you, Adrian. I'll, I'll struggle on while you go and enjoy yourself. You know, my yeah, all right. <laughs> No Let's put this on. I probably should have been reviewed him with this one, but there we go. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Abe. Hey. Thanks very much. Mm. Thank you. Alan, sorry, before yeah. you go, Lisa's had her hand up patiently um, to right. ask a question, if that's okay. Uh, thank you. In fact, um, Alan got in before me. I too was going to yeah, ask, sorry. based on. You, Can you hit me okay? Yes. Um, based on evidence from other areas, particularly in the suburbs of London, there has been dramatic displacement of traffic. Um, and more critically, more critically, where there has been restriction of traffic, it negatively impacts um, two groups of um, traffic, emergency services, and there's been a number of, of examples where ambulances, fire engines haven't been able to get through and also um, support, home support workers who are normally on a fairly tight uh, schedule. They've got to go and visit a number of people and yet they're being hampered by not being able to access. And I, I think that it, they, these are uh, easy to brush aside but they are critical, and in both cases, they're critical. I completely agree, Lisa. So um, two things that we're doing there is, um, as I said earlier, we're, we're doing that wide engagement event next to try and tease out any of those, any of those concerns and issues uh, that people might have. The other important point is that we've created what, what we've called a technical reference group, which includes the emergency services, so police, ambulance and fire services, people like our waste services, um, and, and all those sort of specialist groups who provide our services and, and, and utilities in effect uh, to make sure that our designs as they're coming through the process uh, uh, are, are, are kind of checked by them, I suppose, and, and, and reviewed, um, and we're making adjustments as we go. Um, if we feel that there are potential concerns, that's where I think the experimental TRO process is gonna be really, really useful. Um, and we can then adjust and adapt as we get that feedback in real. Could I ask a supplementary on, on that relating to blue badge users? Yes. Um, you know, it's all very, because that, that is critical. It's all very well saying they can park a mile down the road and, and walk, they can't. Yeah. In some cases they can't, particularly those on their, on their own. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're, we're really keen to accommodate all those views. So um, that's been a big part of making sure that, um, you know, what we're doing at the moment uh, is able to be, uh, you know, is inclusive and accessible. So people um, who, who may be disabled in some way can have their say um, and we can get those views heard. Um, I have to say, Claire, um, at this moment in time, I think we've done a, a fairly good job um, of hearing those views based on the work that we're doing at the moment, Lisa. But again, I think that next step, uh, and I know I've certainly had it expressed by some disability groups, for example, um, that this stage that we're currently at is perhaps a little bit difficult for their audience to engage with. And so we're working really hard to make sure that at that next stage, we do work really closely with those groups and get their voices heard and, and therefore be able to adjust and adapt the schemes um, and the design work to accommodate any concerns that they may well have. Thank you, Lisa. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, I mean, I would like to commend Ashley when, we're, when we dark. have a short, we have a shortage of energy, and you're working in the dark. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> the light's failing on me. <laughs> Lead me from the front. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. I've gone back to Bethlehem. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm right in saying I'm sort of reading a lead in, aren't I, to the next bit, Sarah or Alison? Yeah, a nod. Okay. So we're talking about uh, building resilience. Um, and there are two parts to the agenda item. Uh, with the cost of everyday basics like petrol, energy, and food rising rapidly. 
these increases are affecting households and I'm sure we're all, all experiencing that. Uh, although the prices affect us, although the prices affect us all, they disproportionately impact those most vulnerable in our communities and predominantly people on lower incomes will be hit harder than others. Local services such as Citizens Advice Bureau and the Council's welfare support teams have already seen an increase uh, in financial help or, or the request for financial help, including debt advice, access to food, helping with energy bills. Uh, so this is also felt across other services such as mental health. So, you know, the community is suffering and the pressure comes back on the services. Uh, the council and other voluntary sector partners are working together to look at what support can be afforded or offered, sorry. Uh, we need your help though, it's as simple as that. Uh, if you are, the question is, are you planning any initiatives in your local community? Identifying warm places, offering grants, food clubs, etc. And then what feedback have you received from residents and clients about the impact on the cost of living crisis is having on them? So if there are any thoughts from the group, uh, you know, we would encourage people to add information in the chat or send it to the team after the meeting, because clearly it could be a very broad discussion um, with lots of offers of help or opinions. So I think for, in the interest of sort of conserving time, uh, if you can enter those in the chat function so that uh, both Sarah and Alison can capture those afterwards, um, hopefully that will, will work well. Uh, and we'll keep you updated uh, on progress and share any information that can, can be communicated within your networks and within your communities. So we would appreciate you taking that on board. Um, and as I say, if you can put your thoughts into the chat, that would be very good. Alan, so part can, Alan, yes, can please. I just add, is, is that okay? Just to let um, everyone know and, and help in terms of um, residents and promoting it to residents, if that's possible around the support that is currently available. So we are using our community wellbeing hub as a central point to make referrals for people um, and to promote um, the services on offer there. So you can get a direct referral to the Citizen Advice Bureau, the Council's Welfare Support Teams, Bath Mind, Help with Housing, a whole range of different services. So you can call just the 0300 number. We'll put that in the chat in a moment um, and people can get referred onto those services and support. We're, we're also, um, developing an online referral form for um, professionals, which we will make available and share that with you um, in due course once it's ready. And the idea of that is for organisations like Food Bank, um, uh, Community 67, maybe the community libraries, to be able to, um, when they're talking to um, service users or clients um, or residents, they could make a direct referral into the hub for support. Um, we're also um, looking at um, creating a registration for organisations to register as their warm places. Um, so it's initiatives that have been developed right across the, the country, um, which are community spaces that are opened up for people to come um, and have a warm welcome, um, uh, non-judgmental places for people to come when they are struggling um, financially and uh, um, need need a bit of extra support so as soon as that information is available we we will let you know um, some examples we know that um, are happening already in the Canesham area Saltford Community Association um, contacted us to let us know that they've got their grant scheme available which is open for residents that are in financial hardship um, I know there's some comments in the in the chats here about um, um, about community 67 and together looking at um, identifying some warm places so um, if you could let us know um, any information that that's on the ground in terms of 
activities, um, any issues that are rising that you think that we're not addressing in terms of um, support, then do let us know. I think it's a constantly moving issue and um, I guess we're not going to feel the, the effects of it until um, the, the real winter and, and um, as we go into into the autumn so um, do keep in touch and, and um, we just wanted to reassure everybody that we are working collectively um, between the council and our partners on some initiatives um, across the whole district. Thank you Sarah and, and it should be noted really that the wellbeing hub has been almost continuous I think it's right in saying from the commencement of Covid uh, and probably hasn't really had a chance to wind down before it's onto the situation we're in at the moment. So a big thank you to you, to Alison, and to all those that work there with you. Right, um, the next part is a presentation, uh, well, headed working with our communities to build emergency plans for future events. Uh, and Daniel Node and Lucy Dibble, is it pronounced that way? Uh, from the emergency, sorry? Dibble. Dibble. You know, I thought about going that way and then I thought, well, I don't know. But <laughs> however you pronounce it, you're both very welcome um, from our emergency planning team. So over Thank to you. you Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Alison, are you going to share again like last night? Is that OK? Or would you? Oh, brilliant. You've started. Fantastic. OK, if you go on to the next um, slide, Alison. You started brilliant. Okay, so um, just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Daniel Node. I'm the team manager for emergency planning, and I'm here with my colleague Lucy Dybal, who's my team leader. And what we uh, we generally work on sort of emergency plans for the council to uh, respond to incidences and recover from incidences. And we work with our emergency services colleagues, uh, police, fire, ambulance. Um, but what we're trying to do is to do some. Uh, work in the community settings uh, off the back of what Sarah has just described in regarding to in, in respect of empowering individuals, households, businesses and community, community groups, public organisations to take responsibility for their own resilience. So what we want to do is supplement our own plans with more community resilience, which means when the worst happens, all sections of our community have protected themselves and are enabled uh, and able to support each other in a pre-planned way until life returns to normality. So we realise that, um, you know, once the emergency services have got on the scene, they don't always have local knowledge or they don't understand the risks that uh, may be presented within those local communities. So what we want to do is build those links with the community to understand the risk, write plans, exercise those plans, and that will support our own plans and those of the emergency services as well. And we also know that once an incident's finished and the emergency services say, well, we've done what we can do here, they move you know, back to um, other incidences or um, whatever else they need to do. We realise that actually what happens is the communities are then left. So what we want to do is make sure that we have robust uh, recovery plans in place to sort of um, help the communities go back to what that new normal might be. Um, and it's really important that we, um, you know, respond to incidences, but then don't leave the communities to themselves, but actually have plans to support community uh, communities in the recovery phase as well. And some incidences like, um, you know, some, uh, you know, we always sort of um, mention this in some of our presentations, Aberfan that happened quite, you know, some years ago, is still in recovery. 7-7 seven, seven is still considered to be a incident that's still in recovery. So it's really important that we support communities once they've had an incident. And the idea of community resilience is help response and also support recovery as well. Uh, next slide, Alison. Um, so this slide here, um, is a slide that looks at all the different areas that we can um, we need to look at and what support there is out there. And you'll see the roof there, or the hats, as, as someone said it the other day, um, of resilience communities, and it's the sort of hats above the pillars there that keep us keep this sort of resilience communities um, going and underpins that roof. So um, what we want to be is more sort of risk aware um, as individuals. And that's um, a risk in, risk in our community. So we sign up to weather warnings. The Environment Agency have really good a really good uh, weather warnings app where you can pick up um, alerts, warnings, and severe warnings if um, that happens. And there's very 
you know, little severe warnings, thankfully, but it's a really good way of the Environment Agency um, communicating warnings through to communities and really useful. We're all signed up to it and it provides great communication in regards to, you know, what, um, you know, those warnings and what we can expect to hit us when there's a storm approaching and so on. And clearly we had some storms last year. Um, so it's a really good way of sort of underpinning that um, information that comes through to us as emergency responders, but also to those community members as well. Um, the second um, from the left there is about individual um, and family resilience. So it's important to understand our own resilience because then we, can, we become less burden, uh, less of a burden on the emergency services. So it's really understanding what we can have in our own sort of personal plans, i.e. a grab bag. So I have a grab bag at home so I can pick up if my family are um, evacuated and I know I'm in emergency planning so you probably say you're bound to have a, a grab bag but it, I think it's really important and in that grab bag I have some personal household um, uh, pl plans and mobile charges and so on all those things that you need these days to keep um, yourself sort of safe and being uh, able to update yourself on the latest information should that incident be affecting your communities. Um, the third uh, pillar there in the middle is about supporting our community carers and vulnerable. We know in every community we have those people that are vulnerable. We have those you know, carers that go beyond, um, you know, anything to help those sort of um, vulnerable people in our community as well. So it's really about being um, in regards to resilient is, is knowing who, um, your, you know, who needs support in your um, area, so your neighbourhood and so on that needs that support. And also being able to check on them, ensure that carers can fulfil uh, visiting them if there is an incident. And also passing that back to um, us as a local authority, all the emergency responders as well. So they know who those vulnerable people are. They know um, what issues there are in regards to actually getting to that premises to ensure that medication and other needs are supported. Um, the fourth um, pillar there um, is business continuity. And it's being business continuity is aware of our resources. What resources are at hand? What can we use? Um, and what volunteers can we uh, support? So us as a local authority, we coordinate volunteers in the event of an incident. Those are groups like Samaritans, St John's, Red Cross, that can all support us in providing a range of different um, areas of support. Support, from emotional psycho, uh, social support to practical support of feeding or looking after pets. Those groups are invaluable to us to be able to support us in an incident. And that provides us BC uh, business continuity when our staff are tired and um, struggling or areas where we don't have the expertise. And then the last column there um, on the right hand side is the Avon and Somerset Local Resilience Forum. We all come together as what we call Cat One to responders in the local resilience form that provides a framework on how we respond. And it ensures that we all have joint situational awareness, we understand the risks, we write plans together, and we know how to respond. That is the strategic um, aim of the local resilience form, and that will feed into our local plans here in the local authority. But then we want to go that step forward and work with communities and provide those operational plans as well. And I noted Lottie on the call, and thanks Lottie, because Lottie's done a lot of good work in Salford as well, which has been invaluable as well. Um, next slide, Alison. Brilliant. And what we're trying to do is also highlight the hazards in communities as well in those areas. So we all have different hazards um, in areas where we live that might be different from others. But the idea is in this community resilience is to actually work on those hazards, have a plan to mitigate as best we can. We know they're still going to have an impact, but what we're trying to do is minimise those impacts. And I heard um, as I joined um, issues around the energy crisis and you know, with fuel prices going up as well, that obviously affects not just um, people that have vulnerabilities, you know, uh, and other people, but also affects the emergency responders and volunteers as well. So we need to understand that and how that might affect support that we need to give. We know every winter we get the threat of snow and, um, you know, we need to understand how that might affect communities as well. There are certain communities actually not just in, not quite in Baines, but further out where they literally get cut off. And, um, you know, that provides that own problem, uh, those problems as well. So it's important that we start to write plans on how 
uh, you know, how we would support um, those communities as well. And obviously, bottom uh, right hand side is flooding. Um, and we have areas like Chew Magna where we have the fast um, responding river there. And um, it is a concern every year when we look at the Environment Agency's rivers online. We see the um, when we have a you know a bout of rain um, that's heavy that um, those rivers respond really quickly, which means that we need to get in touch with those uh, the community at True Magnet to ensure that we're supporting and power outages as well. We've been doing a lot of work in the local resilience forum around blackouts um, and um, ensuring that uh, what we can do as emergency services to support. But if we know again those vulnerable uh, vulnerable people within those uh, communities we obviously then can start to support and put plans around and also be in touch with those community um, members uh, that uh, Sarah was talking about um, to ensure that we can get the right information so we respond leanly and to those people that need that help. Uh, next slide please Alison. Um, so what we're trying to do here is to pick up um, the um, Sorry, just clicking into my slides here. What we're trying to do is uh, be prepared, risk aware, and to be more resilient and build an action plan. So, uh, um, and what we're trying to do is, is to not expose yourself to risk um, and to, you know, to undo risk. And it's important to try and prevent the best we can. So we obviously do that generally in our day-to-day -day lives. We're trying to prevent um, risk. And then we write a plan about how we might protect ourselves. So if there was a flood uh, and we were, in that flood so you know me and my family what was our plan where would we go uh, where would we go to get information and that's how you, you know how to uh, how to know how to respond so you know you have a plan where you would go and so on and i think that's really important because we all think oh yes we'll you know we'll, we'll do this we'll do that but we can't guarantee that other people in our family household will do the same thing. So if you know, if you're more resilient as a family household, as we were talking about earlier, then it's good to also have a plan of how you would actually do it. And there's the a good old, um, grab bag as well, which um, I mentioned I have at home as well. And there's a good example there with some of the items that we need that are really important, like um, mobile phone chargers, flashlights, uh, radios and so on. And that's really important to actually keep ourselves informed and keep ourselves safe as well. Uh, next slide, please, Alison. Um, and this bit is about people. So mostly um, uh, uh, disasters and incidences are very much about people. Um, and, you know, it affects people. It's, you know, people we care about. And it's really important that we have those plans and we have those people on the, uh, on the ground that are able to feed that information back to us because then we as responders can be uh, more armed in regards to what we're doing, make sure we get the resources in the right place. And that's incredibly important for us to do that. Um, and we know the most vulnerable in our society need that support and we need to get to them quickly. We recently had a water burst main in Charlton Road um, near Cainshaw where you know, we have priority lists where we can get that bottle of water out to people that need it first and make sure that that resource and those people are looked after. And that's really key as well. Alison, next slide. So this is all about cross-organisational working and partnerships. And if I start on the top um, left-hand side, you know, we talked to, uh, talked earlier about health has been um, uh, still um, self-reliant, taking action for yourself and your family and do what you can do, no matter how small it can make a difference. Um, and as we go uh, along to the right-hand side, you have building social capital through bonding and bridging, encourage social interaction, you know, talk to your neighbours, find out what they're, you know, you know if, if there is an incident, if you know people, then you know you know a bit more about them. You're able to give a bit more information. Should we need to do it? And on the left, on the right hand side, building social um, capacity, um, being more safe and secure, more tolerant and respectful, and therefore it just builds that resilience essentially because we're more respectful of people that um, might need need uh, might um, need help. Um, and as we go down there, support local businesses and local production, mutual support cooperation. So in uh, communities, mutual support really goes a long way. It seems obvious, but, you know, a lot of communities don't have that now. And it's really important that we do. And I think that sort of piggybacks on the back of Alison and Sarah's work as well. Business, business continuity, self-sufficiency, disaster recovery and supporting the local community. All those things are really important, you know, especially in recovery, because, you know, in Salisbury, in the Novichok incident, 
the uh, visitors to Salisbury, which relies heavily on, on people going to um, Salisbury to um, maintain the local community, dropped off because of obviously the concern and so on. So it's really important that we support those local communities and they support themselves in regards to, um, you know, um, getting the local community going again. Sharing resource, networking, we mentioned that earlier. Um, organisations, shared understanding and approach to community resilience. That's again, writing the plan, working across organisations and focusing on the vulnerable and carers. All those things seem fairly obvious, but in a plan, it's the plan. We know, um, you know, what to do, train those, uh, train the community volunteers, and we are stronger as a community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what are we going to use? So we will use advice and guidance. We will put together um, our um, internet page where we're signpost people to and we can um, we can do that and that's under work uh, under work at the moment um providing posters and communal um community resilience manuals as well warning and informing how do we do that how do we get into communities to warn and inform of um issues that's really important as well and promote that as well so you know these parish meetings is a good way of promoting you know what we can do and how we can support and we'll come on to the plan in a bit publications channels and people's networks as well it's getting the information out there and telecommunications contact details so if there is an issue out of hours an incident who do we need to contact how do we contact and those things are really important as well next slide please okay i'm going to pass to my colleague now great so um what we're planning to do is have community volunteers and contacts um and their kind of role would be to develop the community resilience plans for their own community um and link with existing community or parish plans that that they may have um and act as a point of contact for the emergency services in an emergency um providing useful information about the community and resources that they may need um so again, as Daniel mentioned, you know, if there's an emergency, the emergency services on scene might not know your community as well. Um, and so that local knowledge is really is really key. Um, and to act as a focal point for promoting community resilience within within the community and supporting the community and local authority preparing for emergencies, um, providing warnings and, you know, having having that notification so um that's what we want to kind of develop and start integrating within communities um so if we move on to the next slide please so part of part of those community volunteers or contacts they will be in charge of putting together these community emergency plans or updating the ones that they may already have um, and we've got templates here that, that we can send out to everyone um, and they can fill out all the information. And then linked to that is also the community flood plan, which um, is another template linked um, to, to the emergency plan. And that comes from the environment agency, um, but they're all linked together and we can provide you know, help and information in filling out both of those plans. Um, but the key is to have those contacts who would be able to Kind of own those plans and spread the word within the community um, and what we'll do is we'll work with the community engagement team um, to get in contact with with those in the community to to kind of start you know get getting these in place or getting them updated with those who already have them and next slide please um, so these are the resources that that we currently have for communities to use um, so the poster on the side is new, um, so it's not out yet, but we're going to be putting those out soon um, once we've updated our website. So we'll make sure that our website, web address is on there as well. Um, and on the website, we'll have all of the resources. We'll have the plan template. We'll have loads of information about hazards, what to do, all of that. Um, then obviously the plan template on the other side. So you'll have that, which you'll be able to pick up and, and fill out. Um, we've also got a Twitter page um, where we'll be able to put out messages of any hazards or resilience information, all of that helpful resources. There's also, um, you know, months where, where there's promotional activity like September, which is known as preparedness month, um, where messages get put out about how you can be prepared for different incidents. Um, there's for flood planning advice, 
there's the environment agency they've got loads of information and they can help with all of that um and then our email address at the bottom emergency planning at bathnes.gov.uk you can email um if you need help with any plans um or updating um and that's the email address that we'll be using to to get in contact and um develop these plans um, next page please so um our next steps we're going to identify these emergency community contacts so we'll be in touch with the community engagement team and they'll be in touch with the communities and we'll get that started um and then we'll we'll work with communities to write draft develop emergency plans um and once those are complete then we will hold a copy of all of those as well so if there is an emergency in in a local area we'll be able to see what their plan is as well as what our plan is um and then integrating that into the communities and developing you know that community resilience and making sure everyone knows what to do if there's an emergency in that area where where's the safe place to go all of that um and then test exercise and update so that's kind of emergency planning um what we do so once you've updated a plan we want to, you want to test it you want to make sure that everything in there is correct um updating it so usually we update plan every year make sure the contact details are up to date everything's still correct maybe if you've got a map in your plan something might have changed on the map that you want to update all of that so those are the next steps um and we will be in contact with the community engagement team to kind of put all of that in place and the final slide is any questions If no one else is jumping in, I will really quickly. Um, Lottie, Lottie has put her hand up. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just we've been engaging with Daniel and the team um, before the pandemic and after. There was a bit of a gap in the middle, um, and there's quite a lot in there that would be really helpful to pick up and I have a conversation about. Um, I don't think there's time for it now. Um, one thing would be about um, how knowing who is vulnerable in the community would actually what that would actually look like on the ground during the COVID pandemic we tried very hard to try and find out through Baines and Virgin Care who was vulnerable in our community through the fear of some people uh, dropping through the net obviously some vulnerable people came forward and we were aware of others but we were very concerned that there were others in the community who um, <clears throat> we might be missing um, and if you don't know who they are you can't tell us who they are and we don't know who they are then they're really the ones that we want to know, um, you know, what your thoughts are around about how, how to look after these people in the case of an emergency. So that'd be one thing. And the other thing which won't surprise you is um, the emergency plan and how Salford didn't feel as though the emergency plan was going to be practical on the ground, um, both as a working document nor as um, the administrative burden, considering it's it's uh, being looked at, a, you know, a community group um, to oversee it. Um, volunteers are... Uh, numerous in Salford um, and very active, but spread awfully thin. Um, so to, you know, thinking about maybe some other areas in Baines that may not even have that strong um, voluntary community presence to take this on, um, especially with the <coughs> with how the emergency plan looks, um, it may not, it may make some communities feel as though they can't engage. Um, but, you know, you've seen what Salford's response has been, what we felt as though we could do. Um, in terms of community resilience um so I'll, I'll just you know put that forward as a comment really but thank you you know for the support that you've given us so far and putting together so at least we've got something even though it's, it doesn't look like what you would like it to look like we we do actually have something practical that would work should there be an emergency well we hope it would work um but hopefully we won't find out but you never know and i think that's a really good point i do take you know the administrative burden which um you know, in some cases, it's going to be difficult to fulfil. And I think what we will do is commit to communities that, you know, it may be that the, the template doesn't fit, as, as, as uh, Sulfur did feel that that template would fit. But even if it's just sharing key contacts and um, knowing where the place of safety is, then that is really quite crucial as well. And that would be the basis of a plan. At least then we would know 
where people are going to gather, where we need to provide information on the incident to keep people um, informed, then that is is probably a really good start and maybe as far as the plan goes for um, certain communities. Yeah, and, and just to say to everybody who's thinking about it, I mean, we solve a parish council is hosting a dedicated web page about resilience. So um, the community, the Salford Community Association and Baines Ward councillors and the parish council are all working together, but it's the parish council website that's hosting it. Um, and we're using um, our own social media as well to support that so that residents know where they can find that information about a place of safety. Um, and also we do have notice boards in the off chance that obviously everything goes dark um, and we don't have the internet. And, and obviously there are those in the community who don't um, have the internet as well. So um, hopefully we'll keep sharing that message and any other messages that Baines wants to send out so that residents can be aware that there is information out there and how they can offer their support as well um, and inform us about vulnerable people in the case of an emergency, including a phone number that can go live immediately as well. Absolutely. And I think what um, Lucy said as well in regards to prepared month in September, it'd be really good to sort of pass that information on to, um, you know, community members as well. Um, Sara. Yeah, I just wanted to come back and, and um, pick up the point that Lottie made about sharing of data around vulnerable people. Unfortunately, during COVID, we did have obviously those people that was clinically extremely vulnerable and we were unable to share that data because of the data sharing agreements with the government. We did explore that and it was unfortunate and it would have been great to be able to work with you, but we were, we were governed by those, um, those regulations and, and it was just impossible. Um, but I, I, think, I think really in terms of, I know Dan, we had a, an issue back in earlier on this year around um, identifying some vulnerable people when we had a power cut, severe power cuts in, in the Summer Valley and Chew Valley. And, um, and, and actually what's the best way of, of doing it is working with local groups and organisations that are working with people. So we used our village agent scheme um, to contact people. And I think that's that's the key really, because um, I don't think there is that there isn't a sort of one database of, of a list of vulnerable people and how do you define that? Um, so it is um, it is really tricky and sharing data is very <coughs> difficult, but I, I guess what we want to do is work with you. We need to learn from some of the lessons from COVID and how we can sort of get over some of those particular issues in the future. I think that's a really good point, Sarah. And uh, I think it's key as well, sorry. No, um, sorry oh, I just could I just step in a second? Yeah. I have two hands up. I'm not going to take any more. That's Scott and then Dawn. Sorry, Dan. No, no, that's fine, Alan. Go on. You were sorry. I sort of cut into you. Oh no, no. I think that's really interesting as well, and it's something that was in discussion today with the local resilience forum about sharing data, but also determining what is vulnerable as well. And I. I think that's a key question and if there's a major incident the length of time affects different vulnerabilities as well so um that is we're working on a data sharing protocol um under the civil contingencies act um you know data can be shared there's an exemption but it's working through that so that's a really good point sarah thanks Alan. thank you Sorry. scott um just really quickly um i guess part a large part of your challenge is convincing people that they are at risk um, of potential displacement. And I know only last week in Bath there was the fire and you had dozens of people being moved out of their homes. Um, as someone that's put together a small amount of resources, I know how hard it can be trying to source things to go in a, a grab bag. Would you ever consider selling them, um, like for instance, at cost, because you can put together the resources at, on scale um, and put the things that people need in all in one place? It's a really good question. I haven't considered that before. That's a really good question though. We will, we will take that back. Thank you, Scott. That's a really interesting question. Never considered it before. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dawn. Yeah, Fine. I'm going back to the, like, the GDPR uh, aspect. Is there not a concern with um, the plan not being held by a registered community group or a town or parish council that if it's held on someone's personal computer, various names and, and things that if that computer goes missing, then you've got a serious breach of GDPR. Um, are you expecting the whoever leads on them to be someone that has GDPR cover and can handle if there is a breach? 
Absolutely. Yeah, we'll work with our information governance team to make sure we're apply we're you know we are complying to uh, GDPR because it's incredibly important. Yes, good point, Dawn. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the idea would be that those community volunteers would be those within the parish council or those who are the key holders to the village hall or you know those those active members of the community already. Um, that that would be the idea. Okay, Daniel, Lucy, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I think you won on the number of questions. So um, it was worth coming, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, thank you, Alan. Right. Take it. Cheers. Right. Um, now for the really exciting part of the evening. And we are, um, we are a few minutes farther on than we wanted to be. Uh, but it's the AGM. Um, so initially we have to agree the notes of the previous AGM meeting held on the 19th of August 2021. Uh, would somebody like to propose that if anybody thinks they can remember? Was I there? I don't know. Yes, probably. Um, Alison did circulate the notes with the papers. So um, if people so have no have... objections, yeah, if people have no objections, we'll take them. Right. That'll do. Uh, also to note the chair's annual review, which was previously circulated with the papers. Um, you all remember that, do you? Well done, Dawn. Thank you for nodding. Um, so uh, we'll note that then on, on Dawn's say-so. Uh, no requests have been received for the terms of reference to amend or update. Uh, and nobody wants them now, do they? No, take that as a no. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Sarah now because it's it's about officer things. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, so this is the um, the other exciting bit of the meeting, which is where we vote in the chair and vice chair. Um, before we start, is there any nominations for chair and vice chair that you'd like to put forward now? Um, Alan and Adrian have offered to stand again if... Um, that is something you'd like to um, vote and support um, as a group. Um, unless there are any other nominations that people want to put forward, this is your opportunity now. No, okay. So um, I will then put to the vote if uh, everyone's happy that we have a re-election of Alan and Adrian. Alan as your chair and Adrian as your vice chair. Are you all in favor? Great, thank you very much. Back to you, Alan. Okay, thank you, folks. Um, that's very kind of you. I don't know whether that's because you want me or nobody else wants to do it, but um, whichever it is, I am very grateful for your support. Um, well, we've done that bit then. So really, it's just uh, the dates for future meetings. They haven't, and that's for 2023, and they haven't been... Uh, a, arranged yet which is understandable so um we'll keep you in touch on, in that respect uh so really it just remains for me to thank you very much for coming this evening um brian i offered your apologies but he's here as well so um <laughs> so thank you for that uh yeah thank you folks for your contributions for your interest uh, and for your attendance. Uh, we'll see you in the new year. So happy Christmas. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.